So to begin tonight, just wanted to start with a welcome and a land acknowledgement to everyone. And in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which is the Siksika, the Ghana, the Pikani, the Tsutsina, the Stony Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. I would encourage you to become curious about the traditional keepers of the land and their elders and look to uh, be even more curious about their stories as well. So my name is Jordan Stewart. I am uh, grateful to be sitting here tonight with you as the CMSA technical manager. I've coached players anywhere from U4 to university age players. Uh, and I, previous to this, I used to work for Alberta Soccer as their regional coach for Southern Alberta and the Alberta Rex director. So my role there was around player development province-wide. Uh, if you can believe it, there's about 100,000 odd players in, uh, in the province, men, women, and children. And they said, Jordan, it's your job to figure out the player development strategies. You can imagine how well uh, that was and, and managing that kind of scale all on your own. Did a lot of district outreach there in terms of finding out what was going on around the province and how we could help to support the game and also a ton of coach education while I'm there and still trying to be active in that as well. I've got experience working through the grassroots club system here in Alberta, mainly in Edmonton uh, and, and also through the professional academy that's unfortunately no longer with us there with FC Edmonton. As I mentioned, PSO experience, youth national team development system, worked in both colleges and universities, uh, community outreach programs, and now very lucky to be trying to make an impact and trying to move the game forward here along with the rest of the CMSA staff uh, within a district governing body at CMSA. I always feel like it's important to look back, to acknowledge the, the work that we've done, to share our successes, and to really celebrate those successes in a way and tonight, I'll start off with a quick video from 2023, as we haven't finished our 2024 year in review video yet, but want to share this with everyone just to really highlight the community that's being built and the wonderful community that we're all uh, very lucky to be a part of in this city. We genuinely feel very privileged to be some of the stewards of the game here in Calgary and we're trying to accomplish a ton of work and, and 2024 I think had even more than that and, and hopefully in the eyes of many people even better than that as well. I'd be remiss if I didn't start tonight about really trying to, to dive into what the player pathway looks like in Canada here because at the end of the day the player is the center of the decisions that we make and, and really the most important part of uh, this soccer ecosystem. So you'll see here a, a chart on your screen and an image that's got a bunch of colored boxes with a bunch of spikes sticking out of them. And what I'm going to try and do is try and make it really clear and simple for everyone. So CMSA will operate at number, sorry, at numbers one, two, and three. So those stages, so active start, fundamentals, learn to train, and then also into stage seven 
which is community uh, soccer for life for the youth and competitive soccer for life for the youth as well. You're probably wondering, well, what happened to four, five, and six? Well, four is really taken care of with the APDL, with Alberta Soccer, as our player development program and developmental league here. For those players that are able to, they'll flow through into a learn to compete stage, so into an excellent stream, which is Rex programs, high performance programs, Whitecaps programs, and then all the way up through into train to compete and uh, train to win. So through youth national teams and pro club academies, as well as into professional first team soccer with the Cavalry, the Whitecaps, senior national teams, and luckily enough now, the Calgary Wild, which will be launching as our women's professional team in 2025. For those that don't pursue that professional pathway, and maybe that's not for them, well, there's still Soccer for Life community streams with CUSA and Calgary Women's and competitive streams with the Alberta Major Soccer League, various CUSA leagues and Calgary Women's Leagues. And then, of course, we can flow through back and forth, and that's what those spikes are for, denoting that, hey, maybe we'll play university or college or NCAA, USL2, UWS, or into League One Alberta. All of these things are available here in Calgary, and it is an unbelievable privilege. I guess everything except for NCAA, which we see a lot of players flow through as well. And all of this and this player pathway is really built on the, the bedrock of long-term player development, LTPD. And what that is, is this is a framework and guidelines by which soccer is uh, meant to be organized by. And you'll see there the stages that we're talking about tonight in terms of uh, learn to train, training to train, and maybe even active for life or soccer for life. And those have propelled the, the creation and maybe modernization into the Canada Soccer Grassroots Standards. This is a two-page document that really rinses out uh, the clarity that's needed to have alignment through the game here in Canada. And I'll dive in just a little bit briefly uh, in a moment. From that grassroots standards, we try to design programs and leagues that align to that. And we put out this CMSA program handbook every year for the clubs to then base their registration package off of. What I would ask is maybe to go and find this on our website, the, the program handbook there, and compare it if you can against what your club's registration information package look like. And ask yourself two questions. Is it accurate and is it aligned? And if it's not, well, then you've got some other questions to ask. And so ask for, as a little reflection piece and, and as a reflective tool to try to continue to make sure that clubs are accountable and communicating appropriately to, at the end of the end of the day, their members, which are you. And speaking of our clubs, all of our clubs have gone through a club licensing process, and we're very proud that all of them have achieved a certain standard of club licensing. It doesn't mean that one is better or worse than the other. It's just a different level of criteria that each club has had to satisfy and look to go through. So our National Youth Club license holders go through, I believe it's 142, it's either 142 or 137 criteria that Canada Soccer evaluates them against. And our SQS holders go through 32 criteria as well. There's different levels and the two levels in between are MA1 and MA2. And so some of our clubs will look to work through those levels. Some of those clubs might look to go from SQS to National Youth Club. Some of them might look to go from National Youth Club uh, back down or across the image uh, to an MA2 and MA1. This is really a mark of, of organizational excellence that all of our clubs here in Calgary have been able to satisfy the requirements. And we didn't have any... Uh, call it casualty clubs uh, along the way. So we're very proud of the work that they have done. Uh, we've tried to support them through this process as best they could, and they've really tried to, to push themselves to a different level as well. But what does all this mean, this SQS and this club licensing piece? Well, one of the core components that it boils down to locally is around coaching standards. And so that's either a modified safe sport roster requirement from what we've built with our clubs from U3 to U11, 
or a full safe sport roster requirement from U12+. plus. So tonight we'll speak to the full safe sport roster requirements. And if you have any other info or sorry, any other questions or comments about the modified safe sport roster, you can either reach out to us or review one of the younger town halls as that will be covered in those. So if there's siblings or other children in your house that fall into there, well, give that a quick review. And there was a shift obviously within our clubs. So they had to adopt uh, probably a higher coaching standard and coaching training standard than what they were used to and maybe what they wanted to accept. But being a part of sanctioned soccer and offering a quality environment and a great experience for our players is at the forefront for us. And we really want to make sure that our clubs are, are meeting those requirements with their coaches. So what would they have done in the past? Well, they would have put someone who satisfied the roster requirements on every single roster that they're no longer doing. And we're monitoring it more closely now in terms of their club database and inputting that into our information and then having a system that says you're eligible to coach or you're not eligible to coach because we want high standards. Our players deserve quality environments and trained coaches. And the clubs now are being held accountable to do what's right, not just what's easy. And their willingness to adhere to very basic standards are going to determine their longevity in the game here in Calgary. And you might be asking yourself, well, what are some of those standards that Jordan's speaking about right now? And the standards have been built like this in a very simple table that, that we look to go through with our clubs season over season and every single time we meet with them, which is about four to six times per year. You'll see their check marks are required for all team officials, that's coaches, assistant coaches, and team managers. You'll see stars that are required education for coaches and assistant coaches, developmental coaches, junior coaches, etc. If you're coaching, that is required education for you. And then the recommended pieces that we feel are really important to cater to those athletes' needs as well. And so previously in CMSA, before the club licensing piece came through, that's what you would look at for the U12s and U13s. Do they have a police clearance? And have they done respect in sport activity leader? Now, you'll see a significant amount more training that we're asking of our coaches um, and assistant coaches for that matter, uh, for them to be completing. You'll see... Uh, making ethical decisions as a non-negotiable, making headway to ensure that our coaches can recognize concussions, can help prevent concussions, and to do that course that is internationally renowned and giving our coaches the leading concussion education that there is currently in the entire world. Rule of two around child safety and around making sure that all interactions with athletes and with youth are justifiable, observable, and transparent. So there aren't closed door conversations happening. There aren't difficult situations and quite frankly, vulnerable and dangerous situations for our players. And then lastly, of course, EAP, which is emergency action planning. And that's really about what do we do when and if an emergency happens? That is all of these blue criteria right there, along with a police clearance and respect in sport activity leader. Then we're also asking them to do technical coaching training. So a theory course that Canada Soccer puts on and a practical component where they come and spend four hours on field with a coach developer to help them, to give them more tools in their toolbox and to make sure that they feel more comfortable approaching that season or through the season. We've also tried to create this as a document that looks kind of like a pathway, a choose your own adventure almost pathway, that if you work through it, you will end up at the same outcome of being properly trained. And this is what we are sending to the coaches to make sure that they understand and they know what's required and expected. Your club should be reinforcing these things with their coaches. You'll see on your screen as well the practical session dates. So if you're a coach on the call right now and you're thinking, oh, I've really got to get that done. Well, please mark down one of these dates in your calendar and make sure that you come and pop out uh, to those dates. All of the registration details are on calgaryminersoccer.com and you can register for one of those courses that are upcoming. 
once we get all of these things in place, we've got our clubs that are licensed, our coaches that are trained. Well, then obviously players come into our club and then all of those teams get entered for CMSA. And we tried to build a schedule. And so I wanted to make sure that there's an awareness about how we look to build the schedule for everyone. The first thing we do is around team entry. And so all of the clubs will enter in their teams. Sorry, excuse me. The house is a little chaotic at bedtime sometimes. The teams enter, or sorry, the clubs enter all of the teams uh, and we put them all into one enormous list and divide them into age groups and tiers, et cetera. Then we bring all of the club technical leaders in and we say, right, this is where you've all entered your teams. Are these going to be good leagues for your teams? You know your players, you know the teams, you know the leagues. Is this where they need to be judging by whoever else put their teams in there? They either say, yes, this is great, or no, move this one here or that one there. And we do that in a collaborative process with them. Then we finalize the divisions and send that back out to them to make sure that there are no clerical errors. And then two women in our organization, Rachel Hugh and Kim Kerr, work tirelessly to start to match up that jigsaw puzzle with our field permit puzzle. And so we get permits from the city of Calgary, uh, which would be the Calgary Soccer Center and Shouldice uh, Dome in the indoor. Uh, we also get permits from Shane Holmes West Soccer Dome and then the Macron Performance Center, as well as the Genesis Center. And sometimes we have to use the uh, out of district areas in terms of Okotoks or Airdrie, et cetera. We try and match all of those things together and build that schedule. Then we know that there's going to have to be some manipulation by hand because we want to try and create a balanced schedule. And then, of course, we release it and everyone says, oh, we're going to that tournament or this tournament or we're away here or there. And we have to do reschedules. And on the call last night, Melissa had mentioned that there are under 100 field permit hours left within the city right now that we have access to. So you can imagine that we're we're bringing all of these teams in, our facilities are maxed out and we're up to here right now, that trying to bring in more players or trying to allow expanded match formats to 9v9 or 11v11 is basically impossible right now. And so if you would love to see these things, it's important that you use your voice and that you contact city councillors, you contact your, your ward officials and you advocate for the game and you advocate for sport and recreation and the development of these facilities. And not that this is going to turn into a political call or anything, but this is something that's very, very important to, to be doing. Then, of course, we've put this schedule together. I think this indoor is in around 4,700 odd games. And we do it all again, season over season over season and work tirelessly to try and get that schedule out as quickly as we possibly can. To give you an idea on turnaround, team entry, I believe, was September 16th or September 18th. And I believe that by the time the Club Connect and all of it's finalized, we try to turn around that schedule in about two weeks. So imagine trying to schedule 4,700 games in two weeks. It's, uh, it's no small task. And this is why sometimes things are delayed. It would be really easy for us to say, here is your schedule before you even register. But that's going to mean that we have to cap each league. And we have to say, there's eight teams in this one, there's 10 teams in this one, and 10 teams. And if you're not one of those 28 teams... I'm sorry, we don't have room for you. So if we want hard and fast, consistent schedules that you know even before registering, that's going to mean that we have to say no to a ton of kids and a ton of players playing the game. Our clubs don't want that. We don't want that. And I would hate for one of your children to be on the receiving end of that, that you're waiting in uncertainty and then you say, oh, by the way, you're not going to be playing soccer now. Here's your refund. Go find something else when there is nothing else potentially open. So I hope that I shed some light in terms of how we schedule and what actually happens there. And then of course, we all get onto the field. And I wanted to just give a quick outline of maybe some conduct expectations because there are player co codes of conduct, there are coaches ones, there are parent ones. And really we all set the standard match to match and every time we're at the training session or team gathering of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And so I put the image there wrestling with a pig because at the end of the day, if we choose to wrestle with pigs, 
on the sideline, on the pitch. Well, the pig loves it because they're used to living in the mud and well, you just get covered in, you know what? So can we elevate ourselves from, from the needless uh, activities that aren't building a positive sport environment? And can we elevate our community and make sure that this is a great environment for kids to grow through and to really change their lives and to develop in the game? And part of the people who have got a massive responsibility and I respect greatly are the field marshals. And the field marshals are that designated parent or spectator that's on your sideline that's maybe asking the one who's having a tough time controlling their emotions to calm down a little bit or maybe walk away that they're not contributing positively to the overall environment and to the experience of everyone, the spectators, the referee, the coaches, the players, etc. And so we want to make sure that this person's empowered and we want to make sure that everyone on this call and on future calls knows that we're not going to be tolerating any abuse towards referees. Even shouting, come on, ref, is not going to change the outcome. In fact, if anything, it probably sways that person who's human and has biases and emotions the other way. So we want to make sure that it's a supportive and positive environment and that we cheer and not critique. And these field marshals are going to be involved in a pregame chat with referees and coaches and captains this year. We know that it's not going to be perfect. We know it's going to be a bit clunky, especially in indoor when spectators are maybe at an elevated position and trying to work their way down to field level will be challenging. But we want to include them as part of the match and to humanize everyone that's in this match so that they have some knowledge and that they can speak up on behalf of the referees or players or coaches who might feel that this isn't a positive sporting environment anymore. Some other kind of global initiatives that we're working towards and, and trying to, to produce good results on are the Empower Her um, initiative, uh, our teal shirt campaign, and then I'll highlight some additional education for some coaches. So our Empower Her initiative is for women and girls in soccer. And so what we've done recently is we've launched She Can Ref, which is bringing together female officials, brand new or very veteran, and putting them in the same room and chatting through some of the challenges and us listening and figuring out how we can support them to both find more female officials, but to develop those that are currently in our system and in our programs. Because it's an amazing stat when there isn't a single, a single pardon me, female official in Calgary that can referee one of the NSL, so the league that the Calgary Wild are going to be playing in, they can't referee one of those games. We don't have a female official in this city with a professional team that's going to be able to referee in that league. It's a travesty, in my opinion, and this starts from younger ages and the culture that is cultivated by us. We've put on additional female-only entry-level courses to try and address this need and try and attract female officials. The junior officiating program that we've launched in high schools has brought in a ton of female officials. Over 50% of those people who are coming into refereeing are female. And this is a massive success, but now it's up to all of us on this call tonight to keep them involved. And especially us through programs, but especially you through what we do on the sidelines and what kind of culture and climate we create. And then lastly, coming up on March 7th, one of our Free Soccer Friday events is going to be dedicated solely to, to women and girls just ahead of International Women's Day of 2025. Uh, and we're going to see a girls only play day where uh, last year or yeah, the last time we did this last year, it was 65 girls came out and played uh, with, I think, 64 percent of them around uh, weren't actually involved in the game or in our database. So can we foster growth within the female game? Because we know that the boys are coming in in droves, but the girls aren't coming into the game as quickly. So we'd love to see uh, see that. And also, we've put the pressure onto the clubs to have a women and girls strategy within their membership affiliation with CMSA. So they have to submit something saying, this is what we are going to do, and this is how we are going to do it. Then we can look at that, evaluate it, support it, and hopefully write some additional grant funding on that pool to then power some of their initiatives and their ideas. And kind of speaking towards referees, we also have Project Ref 
uh, which is a, a, a fantastic program with Kids Sport and Hockey Calgary, where if any of your children are receiving Kids Sport funding, they can go and become a referee free of charge. They get reimbursed for their entry level course. They get all of their gear paid for and any upgrading that they look to do will also be free. It's a great way to earn a part time income, develop some life skills, and we're literally paying for that education. And, and Kids Sport is a massive funder of this. So we have tip of the hat to Kids Sport with what they do there. Our teal shirt campaign is still continuing with first year referees encouraged to wear that teal shirt so they can be identifiable by the rest of the community that they're learning, that they're experiencing things potentially for the very first time at some of these games, and that we need to accept that they're going to make mistakes. Because if we can't accept that now, we're not going to get better quality referees. And that's a common thread throughout a lot of the outdoor surveys and the indoor surveys that we do at the end of seasons, that everyone wants more referees because they don't want to show up and not have a referee, and they want better referees. So if these are core focuses, we have to be comfortable with new referees. There's about 300 odd of them that have come in this season in indoor. We have to be comfortable that they're going to make some mistakes and to not get after them and abuse them and harass them. Within that teal shirt campaign, we're also pairing them up with mentors. So more experienced referees to help them and to put a big woolly coat around them and work through potentially difficult moments with them and track their development as well and encourage them to take the next step in refereeing as well. These mentors are getting a workshop to make sure that how they mentor is aligned and that there's a consistent framework there. And referees are getting monthly educations, or monthly education sessions, pardon me, through CDSRA, which is a local Calgary referee group, uh, and their RED program that CMSA is proud to sponsor and to offer to all referees that are brand new to come in and get further education and connect them in with the community of refereeing. And then lastly, around the zero tolerance policy. So as I've already mentioned, we're not taking it anymore when people abuse referees. So it's reportable by any person. The form is on our website. And this is going to enable referees as well to have additional powers within the game. That if they feel like they're being abused, harassed, discriminated against, they can take timeouts in matches. And at the end of the day, it's costing the players and coaches the minutes on the, on the field. And the referee is still going to be getting paid. So they can take a time out and ask everyone to cool down and then restart when the, when the climate's appropriate. Or we're saying completely abandon the match altogether and don't even finish it where neither team is going to be getting points. So there's an accountability piece that teams need to have for each other. And the key takeaway really on this is coaches, your job is to, to coach, not to question Spectators is to cheer, not abuse, and players just play. Don't bother dissenting. I've never seen referees change their minds when they've they've made a call. They're told to to stay consistent and to be confident, so they're not going to change their mind. Just play and cheer and coach. It's really, really, really that simple. I'm going to come up for air for one sec um, and uh, just give the chat a quick skim and see if there's anything that I need to to address. Um, something about uh, how can we square away player development when smaller clubs are removed from turf fields for training um, I see Melissa has answered that um, so uh, I will move on from that and if there's more questions you can continue to ask them there I talked about referee uh, opportunity. I talked about the numbers of referees that are coming in. Uh, they're coming in in droves and we're starting to open up additional opportunity for them. So you'll see this indoor, a second official on your games. And we're not calling in an assistant referee. It's the second official. What is the second official? Well, it's providing another role for another official at those games. And we're going to be seeing two referee or two person, pardon me, referee crews on all board list games, so our 7v7 leagues, from U10 to U19. That's utopian. 
the odds of us hitting 100% attendance and 100% uh, games picked up with two officials is very, very difficult. With 4,700 games and a pool of referees of about, I think we're at 680 or 700 referees that are active, you can imagine that they're going to be very busy. And really this second official is to assist the center referee in controlling the match in accordance with the IFAB laws of the game or the modified laws of the game for the U10s and 11s. They are all going to have the knowledge of the modified laws of the game and the knowledge of the IFAB laws of the game as they will have completed either the mini ref course or an entry level course to be able to do this. They'll also understand their administrative responsibilities within our game sheets. And before the game, we want them to be helping with the administrative duties because we know that five minutes in between matches and indoor is not a lot of time. So we need additional support there. They're going to have a pregame conversation with the center referee, and they might even take part in that pregame chat that I'll get to here in a moment. You will see them in between the technical areas. And people might say, well, what's a technical area? In between the two team benches is where that second official will be. They won't be running a line. They will not be on the field as a second referee. They will be off the field with different duties than the center referee. During the game, we expect them to keep a record so that the two referees can verify that everything's accurate. To inform the center referee if any of the technical area people are not behaving responsibly. And to also supervise substitution processes and procedures. So checking equipment, making sure players are off the field before new ones enter. They're going to be managing the field surroundings in terms of parents and, and, uh, and players, the balls that might not be in the bag, the water bottles that might end up on the field, et cetera, et cetera. But they're also going to be assisting and in interpreting the IFAB laws of the game uh, and those modified laws of the game. This is a lot of text. You can always go back on the YouTube channel and hit pause and read through it. They're also going to be that second set of eyes for the referee because we've seen video that's submitted uh, where say a center forward is backing up into a goalkeeper and the goalkeeper two hand punches or pushes them in the back and the referee doesn't have eyes in the back of their skull. So the referee misses it. Well, now this second official will be able to see that and be able to deal with these situations. So the game should become safer and it should become more manageable and better for our players and coaches as well. And you might see these people engaged in the pregame script and pregame chat, which I've mentioned already. So what that is, is that's going to have the field marshals, it's going to have the referees, it's going to have the coaches, and the captains of the teams involved in a pregame chat quickly, where you should expect a script very similar to this to be read. Field marshals, please help in ensuring parents and spectators are supportive of the kids on the field and producing a positive sporting environment. Team officials, please coach and support your players. And captains, this is what you can expect from me today and how I prefer to referee. Maybe it's a little harder. Maybe it's a little tighter. Whatever that referee is, is going to be on that day, they're setting an expectation as well. And then from the referee standpoint, as a referee, I've made a commitment and I'm learning. I'm looking for you all to support the game today and have some empathy. And let's just really have a great game today. So field marshals, the expectation is, is that you're at field level for this to happen and then you will go up uh, to the stands to, to resume with, uh, with the parents. I've already hinted that, you know, the number of games and two person referee crews, we might have a no show. We might have a car that breaks down, a dog that gets sick, a family emergency, et cetera, that we try to scramble together another referee to fill in. But sometimes there just isn't a referee there. So what happens? Well, both teams need to agree on who's refereeing the game. The game still gets played. And the teams, if they want, can split the game into two halves where it's I'll referee this half and you referee that half. And maybe you've got a parent or a sibling that's present and is a trained referee that could come down to pitch level. And guess what? They will get paid if they do that as a trained referee. So there's some bonus there for them. And lastly, that last global piece, you've probably forgotten about that slide by now, is some additional coach education that we're trying to produce. 
these things are are like the technical culture series which we've produced and, and i would encourage or sorry encourage all parents to be looking up the the session number 10 with chris mckaig chris mckaig's a veteran uh coach and technical director here in calgary who's now transitioned into a life as an agent uh, and owns an agency now and has shared a wealth of knowledge with how the the international business of the game actually works and if your children are looking to go and play professionally, maybe what you need to know and maybe what you need to know in terms of asking questions of all of the people who say, hey, I'll bring you for trials in Germany or Spain or El Salvador or here and there. You'll be armed with the right questions and information so that you can make an educated decision on is this a trial or is this just padding someone's pocket and is really soccer tourism? I'd encourage you to go and watch that. And then if you're a coach, I'd encourage you to look up the one with Martin Vlick, who's the head of coach education and methodology with the Czech FA, who's bringing a lot of great insights that they're sharing amongst UEFA nations to our coaches here in Calgary. So we're trying to upskill people informally and trying to get them to have better practice here as a coach. There's also an MLS Next Goalkeeper Education Series, which I tuned into the first one and was excellent. The next one is coming up here next week. There's Body Confidence Sport webinars that are on right now. And as I've already mentioned, Making Headway has undergone a refresh. So I'd encourage you, if you're coaching, to redo that course. It is developed by people who have led the international consensus statement on concussions and who are genuine world-leading experts are doing that. And it's available uh, through your locker account there with the NCCP. And lastly, we'd love to see some kids out at the Free Soccer Fridays. We, we get fantastic turnout, but there's always space for a few more. And if this keeps growing, we'll figure out ways to expand it. It's a drop-in soccer opportunity that really we encourage the players to go and develop social and life skills through and use soccer as a tool to do that. It's an unstructured environment where we don't have parents and coaches and adults on the field organizing all of the kids. The kids go and they design their games. They make the rules. They call their own fouls. Or maybe they just go and work on some skills on their own. And it's available time for them to do their thing for free. The upcoming dates are on your screen. The next few are all going to be at the Calgary Soccer Center. Again, due to some facility constraints, we're having to find solutions. And so we're utilizing that Calgary Soccer Center uh, for this initiative right now. It's highly unlikely that we're gonna see this this year, but you never know with, uh, with weather in Alberta and in Calgary, but there's no air quality policy. There's no lightning policy, obviously in indoor, but there is an adverse driving conditions policy. And so an awareness here that all CMSA games will proceed unless the city of Calgary closes the roads due to winter conditions. So that has happened, I think, uh, four or five years ago, uh, but it hasn't happened in recent memory. But it is in there. So we will make sure that if or when that happens, that it is widely communicated to those teams and, and clubs that are affected. And then the messages are getting sent back down to everyone. Okay, I'm going to come up for air one more time here. Um, something about referee consistency, templates uh, for letters sent to public officials. It's a great, a great idea. Maybe something that we look at. Um, uh, yeah, Melissa is smashing it in the uh, chat. So cool. We'll keep rolling. For the U12s and U13s, again, I referenced this piece, the Canada Soccer Grassroots Standards. While diving in and getting a little bit closer to those U12s and 13s, you will see things like this. You will see 9v9 formats and 9v9 or 11v11 for the 13s. We have led a process through the province where we've got 100% district buy-in to be transitioning all of the U13 play to 9v9 for outdoor 2025, including that provincial championship. Pardon me, I misspoke. The provincial championships for outdoor 2025 for all U13s across the province will be 9v9. In 2026, that will become league standards across the entire province for all leagues to be playing 9v9 at U13. There's been this constant feedback that we get around 
well, why do we play 9v9 and everyone else plays 11v11 in outdoor? Well, that's no longer the case. And we're very proud of the work that we've done. We're proud of the courage that the rest of the districts have shown. And we're proud of Alberta soccer for helping to implement this and to making sure that our province becomes more aligned. It's a fantastic format. It's a better format for the players and it's going to lead to better outcomes. You'll also see other things like maximum goal sizes, which we are working very hard to standardize. And we're working very hard to, to do here in the indoor uh, as well. What you will not see is you will not see full alignment to these match formats in indoor. We just do not have the facilities to offer 9v9 formats uh, through the indoor season. Also, you're going to see other things like restarts being throw-ins, right? Referees in games, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is all rinsed for us. It's our job then to implement these things. Then you'll also see things like potentially a retreat line. We don't use a retreat line at U12 and 13, but Canada Soccer is saying, hey, if you require it, you should be putting it at a third. We do not have that currently. Okay, so I want to be really, really clear. And you'll also see flexibility there for a festival or league format. And we know that if we go into a festival format with U12s or U13s, that the culture in Calgary here will have people with pitchforks and torches uh, outside of our office uh, demanding for people to be fired. But these are things that are recommended. So will we get there? Potentially. It depends a lot on the culture and climate of the game here in Calgary. Um, I'm just going to hit pause for one sec because there's a question um, in the chat just around uh, coaching courses uh, and what happens there. Um, says the parent coaches for our kids team have had to pay for the courses with the promise that the club will reimburse. However, the club is yet to reimburse. It sounds like you should probably take that up with your club, obviously, but it also sounds like maybe that club is not a club that you should be at, if I'm brutally honest. Uh, is there a way that CMSA can direct bill the club so that parent coaches who have already volunteered an enormous amount of their time are not out of pocket for the cost and training that the club has promised to cover but hasn't? Uh, here's what I would do. I would submit that club name to CMSA and we can follow up with them as well and hopefully advocate for those coaches and to be making sure that this is something that does get followed through on. If I want to break down how the coaching course funds work, this is how it is. So CMSA will put on the practical on-field sessions, okay? The theory portion is for Canada soccer. And that, those funds go straight to Canada soccer. We don't see a single penny of that. The practical portion that we put on for Learn to Train and Soccer for Life, these two age groups that are on the call tonight, they're $80 for indoor. And someone's going to say $80 to do a coaching course. These coaching courses are over $150 in Ontario. So we're actually one of the cheapest places in the country to do this still right now. Of that $80, $40 of that goes to Alberta Soccer to pay for the course and for the facilitator who's running the course. That goes to them and a portion of that goes to Canada Soccer. Well, that leaves people going, well, wait a minute, 80 minus 40, CMSA makes $40 off of those sessions. Well, not so fast. We pay for the equipment that's used. We pay for some snacks for the coaches. We pay for the fields that are used as well and booked. And I will tell you in the indoor season, these fields at 650, 700, et cetera, an hour to run coaching courses on, there isn't a lot left over of that $40 that goes into CMSA's pocket. ASA is working on a process right now to have in-club learning facilitators that will be able to run the courses. That process isn't completely rinsed yet and isn't completely finalized. But our goal is to be supporting the clubs to be able to run those courses on their own so that it isn't even an $80 charge anymore. It's really the club that will get direct billed from ASA for that $40 a coach the club will get billed. We're not quite there. So in this gray area and in this meantime, we're having some of those uh, those hiccups right now, okay? 
I hope that's answered the question. Um, no problem if, if it hasn't. Uh, ask a follow-up question. More than happy to dive deeper into that as well. Uh, and another question in the chat, what's a festival format versus league format? Festival format is when you would show up, you'd play multiple games on the same day, uh, probably at a centralized location. Uh, it could be in a smaller sided format, it could not be, but you show up, you play multiple games in the day and then you leave and you go home. League format is what you're traditionally going to see. Here's your league table. Here's your schedule of all the teams that you play against. Here's your points, your goals for, etc. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a quick overview of the differences there. Your league structure for this year is going to be 14 randomized games in a 7v7 format. And there's a challenge cup at the end of the season for the U13s and provincials for those U13s. The qualification is both through the league and the challenge cup. And we'll get into that here in a moment. I've mentioned that we're trying to standardize things in terms of the goal and field sizes. So you will see for the 12s and 13s, a six foot by 18 foot net at the facilities. Those are the goals to be using. Those are the goals that we wanna see these players be playing in. Because at the end of the day, you've got a smaller human. We're not gonna put them in an eight by 24. We scale the goal down as well for them. We also have pitch standards, which will have minimum, maximum lengths, et cetera. And what you likely will not see at our facilities is this penalty area here that I'm coloring in red, okay? Sorry for the awful Picasso on your screen, but that is not a line that's typically stitched into our fields yet in the indoor season, but maybe with some retrofitting uh, of some facilities or further development of facilities, we can see some of those things come to life. Your game lengths are all on your screen. So your U12s will play two 25 minute halves on a 60 minute field booking. What does that mean? Well, 60 minutes for the total game to take place, 50 of it will be playing. There'll be a, a short halftime and then there's a changeover from one game to the other. The 13s will play two 30 minute halves on a 75 minute field booking. So again, what does that mean? 60 minutes of play, 15 minutes for both halftime and changeover. We've made this shift last indoor to try and allow these players who are getting older some additional warm up time as well. So there, it's not just like get the socks on, get the shoes on, two quick stretches, one pass and boom, away we go. So we're trying to improve things gradually. And while those may not be massive changes to people, it's incremental gains that we're trying to make season over season. Our U12s won't have any public scores or standings in alignment with long-term player development. And our U13s will begin to show those public scores and standings. I mentioned the kind of qualification pathways for provincials for those U13s. And pathway one is really through league standings. So tier one, two, and three, one team will qualify through the league play automatically. And that's the league champion. They'll go straight to provincials. Tier four will qualify two teams through league play. So it'll be the league champion and the runner up will go to provincials. And someone's probably saying, well, why? And the why piece comes alive here because of pathway two, which is the challenge cup, a postseason playoff series uh, where tier four teams will have already finished their season by the time that this happens. So it won't be applicable for their provincials. Tiers one to three will qualify a second team through the Challenge Cup. And the Challenge Cup is the top four teams. So first, second, third, and fourth that will play off to determine who that second team is that goes to provincials. If the league champion and the Challenge Cup champion are the same team, then the league runner-up is going to qualify for the ASA Provincial Championship in uh, mid-March, I believe it is. We always get asked this question of where does all the money go? Always get it. And it's a completely fair question. I'm not offended by it at all. Want to make sure people are aware that the CMSA fee that the clubs pay to us is $236.25 for the U12s and $241.50 for the U13s. Out of that, ASA takes a $10 fee. And I'm not sure if that's been revised. It could have actually been revised slightly higher right now, but let's work off of that $10 number. What that leaves is what's on your screen. $226 for us to run everything uh, and, and to, to deliver everything. 
and a, a price per match of between 1616 and 1654, including fields, referees, etc. All of the infrastructure, the heat, the power, the lights, all of that good stuff. And where does all of that money break down to? So that 200 and change? Well, the majority of it is for the league costs that they go towards the fields and the referees and other league related expenses. There's a small portion that goes to our facility fund, which will help upgrade uh, both current facilities, but then also potentially build future facilities. Uh, like when Shane Holmes West Soccer Dome got renovated and was turned into a FIFA Pro quality turf field that's 11 aside now, as opposed to the three boarded fields and the one cage field. Uh, and also the shoulder ice bubble that we erected uh, with Calgary Blizzard and Calgary Football uh, a couple of years ago now. There's also a portion that goes back to Kidsport because Kidsport fund over half a million dollars in soccer registrations per year. I think it's actually almost 800,000 now, but it's a ton of money that Kidsport are putting back in to allow kids to play soccer. And we feel like it's important to make sure that we can help to support that system. Alberta soccer, as I mentioned, obviously get a, a small portion of that. A small portion goes towards referee development initiatives. So we talked about She Can Ref. We talked about monthly coach education, or sorry, referee education sessions. We talked about junior officiating programs to bring more referees in, the teal shirt, the mentorship, all of these things. A small portion of every single player fee goes to help pay for that. And then when all of that's gone, a, a small portion helps to pay for the CMSA staff to ensure that Calgary Soccer is trying to run in an efficient manner, manner and we continue to be leaders in this space and to continue to provide a good service and a good game for the players, coaches, referees, and parents at the end of the day. Lastly, I promise, I feel like I've been going on for forever here, but if your children or maybe when your children get injured, please fill out the form that's on Alberta Soccer's website and it has to be filled out within 30 days of that injury. So if it's a sprained ankle, if it's a broken bone, if it's a broken wrist, etc., fill out that form. That's going to allow you access for uh, some of or that insurance funding that you're all paying for with your player registration. What happens is your personal insurance money, if you have any of that, uh, will be exhausted first and then Alberta Soccer's insurance kicks in after that. So if you have a long term injury or if there's something that's happened, this is especially important because those physio and rehab expenses will add up very quickly and exhaust that personal insurance uh, very, very fast. So. If and when this happens, please make sure that you've got the knowledge or maybe that you can be a leader uh, and, and tell the, the other parent that might be sitting beside you or a caregiver that's sitting beside you to be uh, filling out these forms and make sure that there's a record of this. Whew. Well, after all that, really it all begins now. Uh, and it begins on October 15th for some of our teams, which is under a week away. We're very excited to get this indoor season going. We're very excited for, I think, a record-breaking number of teams and an enormous growth in the game. It's absolutely crazy the number of players and people that are coming into soccer right now. Um, and really, it starts now. It starts now with all of us. And, and I'll leave you with this little video to try and summarize everything uh, that's going to happen. <laughs> Hopefully that helps get you ready uh, for the indoor season. I, I want to say a massive thank you to all of you, not only on behalf of the Calgary Minor Soccer um, staff, but also on behalf of your clubs, your coaches, uh, your opponents. Thank you for being a part of this vibrant community that can change people's lives and create a sense of belonging and challenge and, and development uh, that these kids uh, will thrive on, hopefully for the rest of their life. And sports got this abil uh, amazing ability to either cause good or cause harm. So let's make sure that we use soccer as a tool to cause good 
uh, and to create a lot of good. I'll dive back into the chat if there's any other further questions, but if at any point you want to reach out, our information's on the screen. You can email us or call us at the office or reach out on any of our social media platforms as well that we, we operate. And I always leave people with this image on the left that you can tell that the clubs are really starting to pull the game in a similar direction right now alongside us as opposed to when we started this journey three or four years ago now when things were very disjointed and people were going off in a lot of different directions because you can make progress quickly when we pull in a similar direction and you don't make much progress when we're all going in different directions so I applaud all of you tonight for giving up some of your evening and some of your time to be curious and be educated um, and also to ask great questions and maybe to ask really hard questions as well. Uh, so thank you um, again on behalf of everyone involved. Genuinely, thank you. Um, your, your contributions are invaluable. Um, just a, a bunch of thank yous. You're, you're very welcome uh, in the chat. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, uh, there's something here about from what age can agents help players uh, going overseas to camps or being scouted? What I would do is I would look to watch that resource that's on YouTube. Uh, you're going to find out that information. I don't want to misquote anyone, but what I will say is if the parents are not moving overseas for non-football related reasons, you're not getting any work permits until you're 16, 18 ish years old. Okay. So there are lots of regulations around this and there are, are licensed agents. Now there are a lot of people that call themselves agents. There's a lot of people they'll say, Oh, we'll get you trials here. I've got a friend there. Pay me $5,000, pay me $2,000. Don't fall for this stuff. Just don't fall for it. Please use that webinar as a resource to educate yourselves, to educate your, your uh, children as well, and then to reach out as well. Um, Chris and, and his information, his agency's information is in there, uh, and he will provide information free of charge. He's happy to help people. So I would, I would encourage you to reach out and, and watch some of those pieces. Uh, question of, oh, sorry, I'll follow up question with that webinar. The webinar is located on our Calgary Minor Soccer YouTube account. I'd encourage you to subscribe, not because we get any sort of financial benefit on it, but uh, it's really where we try to house a lot of video resources and educational tools. Um, and we'll look to integrate some of that stuff into our website here in the coming weeks and months uh, as well. In terms of the slide deck being available, the slide deck will be available in video form again on our YouTube. We don't send out the PDF. Um, it's not something that we've considered. If that's something that's a, a hot commodity and, and in demand, then we can maybe look to do that in the future. But this whole slide presentation uh, will be available on that YouTube uh, account. We're not going to clip and choose and poke and prod little bits and, and pieces out of it. It'll be there uh, all, all uh, uh, in, its, in its glory. All of my stutters in there as well. So again, we'll stick around for a few minutes. If people have got a few more questions uh, that they want to ask through the chat, more than happy to, to stick around and answer anything. Um, but again, just a, a massive thank you to everyone for tuning in tonight and, and for being curious. couple of thank yous in the chat. You're very welcome. Uh, it's our pleasure. Uh, Stephanie's asked, why are uh, U12 scores not published? U12 scores aren't published uh, because of the research and framework that long-term player development has given us. Um, the There's some research out there that actually suggests that young people and adolescents aren't, uh, aren't able to cope with winning and losing um, and, and that public reminder until they're about 15 or 16 years old. Um, which if you could imagine, if we didn't have scores and standings until they were 15, again, the pitchforks and torches would be out. But what we're doing is we're trying to make sure that results uh, and winning uh, are not the emphasis at a what FIFA would deem a grassroots level. So like under 12 and younger, this is about developing friendships and skills 
and a love for the game. And really all the scores do is, is provide a mechanism of comparison, uh, largely for parents sometimes, largely for players as well. Um, whereas comparison isn't really the top priority at some of these ages, right? We want to make sure that, that they're developing and that they don't have that hanging over their head. There used to be times uh, probably back when I was growing up playing through the game where there was promotion and relegation for youth teams. So you can imagine what that does when a coach has to win games to stay in a league. Um, do they play some of their players who might not be as developmentally advanced as their peers? Well, no. And then what happens to those players? Do they fall out of the game? Do they not develop? So we're trying to take the emphasis off of results. And and really, at the end of the day, comparison is is the thief of joy. So we're trying to make sure that there's still some joy left in the game for these young kids. It's a great question, though, and, and fantastic. Really, really appreciate you asking that. Okay, well, um, if there isn't any fingers furiously typing out another question, um, we'll look to shut it down here in a couple of minutes. Uh, if there is, and if it's a really long one, just type in wait, and, and we'll wait around for that um, to make sure that we get through uh, any other further questions. I see that there's a hand up. Uh, again, if you could type it in, it would be appreciated. Um, again, it's just a bandwidth piece to make sure that we can be um, efficient and not laggy with some things. You'll notice as well, Melissa doesn't even have uh, her mic or camera on. You're all very welcome, no problem. It's, it's truly our pleasure. And so thank you for attending. This is always the awkward point when people have maybe fallen asleep during the, the town hall or the webinar. So um, I'm always intrigued to see who the, the last kind of people standing are. Okay, I'm going to, to sign off for tonight. I'm going to hit end meeting and this recording again will be on our YouTube account uh, tomorrow. So please look for it and share it if you like. Thank you all again for, for attending and looking forward to seeing you on the pitch this season.